one. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Chavistas Chronicles from Caracas. My name is Jesus Rodriguez, and today I have the, the honor and the pleasure of interviewing Leila Carrillo Ramirez. She, uh, Leila is in Havana currently. She's a researcher on global and European issues at the Center for International Policy Research in Havana. She, she was an analyst at the Center for European Studies until 2010. She accomplished several diplomatic missions in European countries. She's a lawyer and doctoral candidate in political science, a member of the Cuban Society of International Law in the, in the, and the, in the National Union of Jurists, and she's also a member of the Cuban Association of the United Nations. She, ha she is an author also of uh, the book, uh, The European Union and Human Rights, and also of, of the book uh, that I had the pressure to read, uh, uh, that is Metamorphosis of Intervention, that, is, uh, that was just reissued in English. She's also co-author uh, of The Problems of Security in the World and the European Union, the United States and Russia, its convergence and divergences in the international context looks from Cuba. And she's also, uh, she has also published numerous articles in scientific, local, and alternative media in Cuba, Mexico, Ecuador, Argentina, the United States, France, Italy, the Holy See, and Turkey. So this is a great curriculum for a, for a great uh, Cuban uh, and I'm honored to interview, to have you here today, Leila, and that we managed to, to you know, to, to do this. So I'm going to jump to the first question. The first question is, uh, how, the, how, the human, how humanitarian intervention and responsibility to protect has affected Cuba in recent years, Leila? Well, thank you for the opportunity. I'm not so high as you think. I'm just reading each day and trying to study a little bit to know better the world where we live. I will say at the beginning that uh, intervention for Cubans is a very, very long history since 19th century during the Spanish colonization. But the intervention against Cuba has grown from 1959 when the Cuban Revolution won. And uh, it is something that has to do also with the history of the United States because from very, very long time, they thought that uh, the, the Cuban country and some countries in Latin America should fall into their hands, it, taking a, a, a part of this philosophy of the backyard, considered backyard of the United States. Of course, this interventionism methods vary following the time and now they have modern methods where we included and studied the, uh, inter the humanitarian in, uh, intervention and the responsibility to protect cult in the United Nations as R2P. But not so known in Amer Latin America, but in the African continent. In recent years, there are many uh, manifestations. Uh, they have shown that from different official sectors of the United States, but also with the press media, with the communications through internet and so on, the cyber networks, and also the Cubans that live in the United States and the mercenaries who work from there, it not was only, yeah, uh, they try to make this humanitarian intervention into, into as a, a, a method that could reach their objectives. The strength 
uh, of humanitarian, uh, we could repeat this paragraph uh, afterward. Yes. But this trend of the humanitarian intervention, we could say that has multiplied itself from November 2020. And it was doubled in July 2021, when the riots, some riots in the streets, and uh, another manifestation. Santa Clara, right? Declarations, declaration of Santa Clara, and declaration of the United States government that they may become in Cuba. Uh, and also with a great propaganda made among different places of the United States, try to use this time that was once one of the worst during the pandemic of COVID-19 and one of the worst because the so-called embargo, that is a blockade against Cuba, was repeatedly made with 240 measures, sanctions against Cuba, started by the government of Donald Trump and maintained during the actual government of Joseph Biden. Then this is something that exists since the beginning of the revolution, as I said. In the 1960s, the government of Dwight D. Eisenhower wanted to inhabilitate the possibilities of the Cuban people and started the blockade against Cuba with one decision, surrender the Cuban people through lack, hunger, and desperation. And this is the thing that exists nowadays, of course, bigger because of this, those measures of 240 uh, sanctions against Cuba. The proliferation of campaigns, campaigns through computer networks called from Miami, but started on their various slogan, SOS Matanzas, SOS Ciego de Avilas, SOS Olguin. And of course, these people who started these movements in Cuba against the revolution and the government and the, we could say the peace of the Cuban people were paid and are paid by some people that come from Miami in the mayor of the cases. The purposes of intervening on Cuba, the losses, and they won't cease. It is a part of a strategy that has to do with the position of the United States in our continent. That's why we say also, always that the most difficult positions nowadays is the so-called humanitarian intervention, because nowadays the coup d'etat does not exist in Cuba, because the government is strong and the people fight still with the possibility to have a better future, a better future that would be there when blockade does not exist. Absolutely. Talking about the responsibility to protect, I would want to say that is written in my book that this responsibility has to do with the petition of a government that does, does not feel that can manage the situation in his own country. But also there are countries, the power, most powerful countries who are interested in intervening and they mobilize all the military positions 
and, and other factors in order to come in one country. But it is against, of course, the sovereignty and the self-determination of a country. Unfortunately, there are more than 60 countries over the world who accepted the R2P and it is a risk for them, selves, and also for another one. We have a position, and I, I, I want to, to, to read that. During our struggle against Spaniards, I mean the Spanish colonialism, Antonio Maceo was one of the two greatest generals. And he said, and I quote, Whoever, whoever tries to take over Cuba will collect the dust from its soil drenched in blood if he does not perish in the contest. That decision is in our blood. We do not ask for help, but also Cubans do not accept the foreign military interference either. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we in Venezuela, what about English? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if you finish or not, but we're in Venezuela. When I hear you talking about, about R2P, responsibility to protect, uh, that is a word. And when I read your book, I, I, some friends of mine sent me the English version of your book uh, last December, and I had the pleasure to read it. And when I read the book in the chapter that you dedicate to R2P, I was like amazed because I mean that's exactly what hap what has been happening also against Venezuela in recent in recent years, and and they try to to implement it uh, uh, in a hard way. I mean uh, they wanted to, especially between 2019 and 2020. Uh, when uh, they begin, the Trump administration began the, the Juan Guaido regime change operation, as I call it, uh, they immediately, especially within the Organization of American States, they began this campaign to try to to try to to use the R2P as a tool for, you know, getting inside Venezuela and, and, and do what they want, which is just get rid of Chavismo, get rid of Maduro's administration. So what do you think about that in our case? I mean, how, did you, how is your analysis? I, I just want to, you know, add a second question within the first question. <laughs> What I try to say in those books I mentioned is that the constantly of the great powers is to have our richness. Venezuela is a very rich country because of oil, because of nature, because of minerals, because of uh, the beaches, because of the people and uh, to have uh, that kind of people means that they will have to fight. But the trouble is nowadays, not only in Venezuela, do not forget Bolivia with the coup d'etat. It is something that came back, get back. Yes. Because as I say in my book, there are different ways of intervention. And it doesn't mean that they are all of them. They could, up, up. maybe they could show another way, another method in some years. There are experiences that the aggression, the interventionism, and uh, the so-called coup d'etat are mixed. And they do not only with the United States, there are some states also they are very interested in our richness. And uh, reading in both uh, two weeks ago, I learned something. The, some presidents in Latin America are discussing the litio possibilities 
to have a join, a program, a control. And at the same time, it is not surprising the Europeans are speaking also about Lithium. I said, oh my goodness, maybe it comes something about it. Because when we speak about go, about aggression and about intervention, there is a link among all these interests. If you see Afghanistan, I said, why Afghanistan was attacked by the US and the rest of the OTAN and the European countries? It is a very poor country. No, I was wrong. Because it has monopoly of something that like the riches. I I I I scared. I scared sometimes because why they attacked Libya? Why there was intervention in Syria that does not finishes does not finish? What why it happened something in Africa, in Black Africa? What it happens in Germany? What it happened in Vietnam once? in the last century. Okay, there also there is an interest of the most organized and developed countries of the world. And they look for something. Resources. Yes, resources. That is the question. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true, I mean, it's sad, but in, 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 I wanna jump to the second question uh, and but first, I wanna you know recall some of the steps that you describe in your book uh, about intervention, and and it's nice the way you draw the line between Julio Caesar, you know, with the first coup d'état in the world, and then you know uh, you know you move on from 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 the concept of coup d'etat that has been implemented since then since Julius Caesar and and but but has been you know modified or improved if you can call it that way mm -hmm. uh, with the concepts recent concepts of peace missions or that that you would describe them also as that there are good you know good uh, peacekeeping missions but there are also the bad peacekeeping missions that are the ones that you know are connected to interventionism but then you advance and talk about the humanitarian interventions and in the in the like in the in the top of the pyramid you put responsibility to protect R2P, like the most recent tool developed by imperialist countries to 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 get what they want for the countries, from the small countries, for the countries that are not as powerful or militarily as them. So I, I mentioned that because I want to ask you how the metamorphosis of interventionism, uh, I mean, what is the relation between the metamorphosis of interventionism and what is happening currently in Ukraine? How do you see that? It is a very difficult question. And uh, the first coup d'etat in Europe was of Julius Caesar. But there were coup d'etat in China many, many, many centuries before. And there were coup d'etat in Japan with another ways. But if we speak fluently about what is happening nowadays, what worries us, I, of course, I am, I have doubts. I have doubts about the methods that could be used to avoid a, 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 a war or not to avoid it. It was warned by the Russian government many, many years ago, saying that it was starting a belt 
among the, the how could you say, fronteras. The borders. The borders. Interventionism has to do with the interference of the internal affairs of any country or more countries or between one group of countries and another. Two or more parties act in, in one conflict. What do they seek among other purposes to protect themselves to respond to interference of aggression or aggressions and to strengthen their defensive or their offensive position in order to ensure the victory. What is the kind and what is the future of a victory? It's something that we have to think about. In the context of geopolitics, Nowadays, the conflict in Ukraine was anticipated by several imperialist governments. They were saying, Russia is going to attack us, Russia is going to attack Ukraine. They declared Russia as their main enemy. It is not only that. When the Soviet Union was dissolved, it was declared, even though it was cut in pieces, 15 republics, it was declared as an enemy of the world war, of the, uh, how do you say, the, the West, the mm. so-called West. Yeah. There are some years ago, in the first uh, national strategic for politics of the United States, China was also declared as another enemy, another trend to the West world. True. It means also a danger for humanity and against the peace. It's something that we have to look for. Because if it happens with Russia, we do not forget that it could happen to China with any pretext they it could be Shanghai, it could be the pandemic, it could be Hong uh, Kong. the. Uh, yes, of course, Hong Kong. It could be uh, an animal that appears in a stepa or something like that. When well, you are looking for a pretext, in this book, in Metamorphosis, I write which are the most non pretexts used to intervene in another country against the peace that could be human rights, terrorism, migration not, uh, not well received, I would say it diplomatically. It could be also uh, drugs, even though the most developed countries are the most consumers of drugs. Over Absolutely. the world, it could be corruption, uh, corruption, etc. And there is another kind of pretext that has to do with the law. If you are democratic or you are not following my point of view, Correct. because what is democracy? We should we should discuss about it very, very, very long, because there are positions that have not to do even with the Greeks in his epoch, mm -hmm. Not now that the democracy, the so-called democracy, has to do with the 25 or, 25 or 30 people, uh, percent of the population that votes in that election. Mm -hmm. Of course, those are protesters. If they do not like the candidate of the left, in one country, they say it was, it is not a democratic election. Okay. In the case of Ukraine, I see something from two different angles. First, the imperialist pose of power to government statements 
the media of computer campaigns accused Russia of attacking Ukraine, supported from outside, insulting it, sanctioning it, and trying to exclude Russia of the inter as an international actor. There are some people, or some, I would say, there are some leaders, so-called leaders, asking if Russia can be in the United Nations organism that has to do with the Charter of ONU. Who is going to change the Charter of 1945? To change it, it needs two thirds of the, the whole General country Assembly. to take part and the five who are in the Security Council. Zelensky will change the Charter. I yeah. only ask that. On the second point of Ukrainian matter, Russia, harassed by the United States, NATO, and the European Union, foresaw and warned about the danger of the things around its borders. But meanwhile, happened the genocide, genocide during eight years, eight complete years, with the silence of everyone, because the people Big Russia in the Donbass were attacked by the right groups in this region. Nobody says anything. Then, how do you see? Is a humanitarian intervention by Russia could be, but there is a completely attack and aggression from all the most powerful uh, uh, countries in the world. That's how you see the ceiling. Of course, it is very, very difficult, and I don't try to make prognosis about this. Yes, it's a complicated issue. It's a very complicated issue. And, and, and let, me, let me add something from the way I see it from here from Caracas. I see that there's also in addition to what you just said, there's also a, a racist supremacist component within the whole situation. And no, I, I haven't read or hear too many people talking about that lately, especially in the context of the you know current conflict in Ukraine. But the fact is that most of the Western European countries, uh, they are supremacist. The most of most of, of the population in those countries have this racism, uh, you know, embedded in them. And, and many of us know, I live in the Soviet Union for several years, and many of us know that uh, those countries in the West see the slaves, I mean, the, 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 the ethnic uh, group uh, called the slave, which um, you know, which groups the Russians, the the Polish, the the the, the Yugoslavian, what what was Yugoslavia in the eighties, uh, uh, and all the countries that uh, that speaks a, a, a language similar to the Russian, uh, they see them like an inferior race, a race mixed with Asians. And uh, I don't know why, but I I have the impression that this racist issue. Is has not been talked enough uh, in the analysis of what is happening in Ukraine because you know maybe they are just trying to portray Ukraine as the victim and they are trying to present Zelensky as a big statement, you know, with you know choreographed speeches here and there. But I think that at the end they don't give it them. Sorry for my Swedish about uh, 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 two slave countries killing each other. You know, you know what I mean? So they, 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 they might be getting, you know, some joy, especially the races in Europe, uh, uh, looking at two slave countries uh, fighting um, and killing uh, themselves. So I, I, I see that as one issue that I wanted to add to the conflict 
to the analysis of the conflict, but also in terms of responsibility to protect, I see that uh, Putin was very careful because if you take the position that the U.S. and Western European countries uh, use when they talk about responsibility to protect, Putin might have used the concept of responsibility to protect to uh -huh. defend the population in Donbass. But he didn't do it. He, he chose Article 51 from the UN Charter, which is different from responsibility to protect. And, and I believe that that's something important also to highlight because, you know, he is not buying, you know, the, the whole responsibility to protect. And, we, and he might have used it, but he didn't choose to use to use it as a legal excuse to the action that he initiated in in in, in Ukraine, in the Donbass. So anyway, I just wanted to comment that. I don't know if you want to add something to that. We could have more 24 hours <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> but I won't ask you. The truth is, 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 is following. I see that uh, now I'm writing, I may start, have started another book, but about migration in Europe and in America. In this book, I have some articles, something that I have already studied about the mentality of the powerful countries about the others. And one of the things that uh, was for me very, very important is to go to get wider in the history of Europe before 1919, when it started the First World War. After this, those years, there was a concept growing step by step among the follower Nazis, saying that there is a group of people under the conception of human being. They escalated in the Second World War saying that the so on humans could be called animals by them were not intelligent and they were subhumans. It has been introduced in the mentality of many peoples in Europe and of course, there are exceptions, but there are groups, people, Nazis, the so-called ultra Veresia. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who is more to read, to, to, to write, that the writers yes. that consider how different could be a people from another. The discrimination measures that have to do with a job, with the possibility to receive an immigrant, to the possibility that he stays or lives in one building with another normal people or another German or another Danish or another Polish, etc. It's very bad. And it means a back step in the sociology in this continent. But it didn't happen, happen for the first time. It happened since the time of colonialism and neo-colonialism in Africa, when they considered the people and divided the people among the existence of those who were born in Europe, those who were born in Africa from 
European citizens. Those who want who, who lived in Central Africa or beside a river or near another clan and so on, and they made a classification of the human being that one is better than the other, and one has right, one has rights that the other one has has any rights at all. And, and it is also similar, sorry that I interrupt you, but it's also similar to the caste Spanish uh, approach to Latin America also, you know, Los, the Blancos de Orilla, the Mestizos, the Pardos, all, the, all those different, you know, caste names that the Spanish applied in Latin America during the conquest, right? Exactly, It's, but, but, attention. What is happening now happened also during the Second World War. The Slavians were considered mm -hmm. underground. Inferior, yes. The Gypsy were considered underground. The Jewish were considered under underground. Yes. Since the British accepted and promoted a nation in order to recompense them. Mm -hmm. But For me, it is not surprising that the propaganda in the USA and in many countries of the European Union or OTAN, because there are some that are non members of the European country, consider one people better than other and consider that it is a struggle among Russians and among Ukrainians. No, it is not the principal point of this situation. The principal point of this situation is, I repeat, and maybe they will accuse me, but I repeat that Russia had the right to defend its borders. Maybe the way was not the best, maybe it was a little quicker, I don't know. I, I am not a military, I don't have to do with this. I am not only analyzing, and this problem, this trouble of if there are people more intelligent, more ready to work, etc. It happens also in the United States. What happens with the black people in the United States? They will fight against The system. other would be a war in this system about this because one are weaker as the other, one are stronger as the other. It's a very difficult question to answer. Yes, yes, it is. Anyway, I mean, I, it's, it's complicated and it's true what you say that we might spend like days talking here about that. And now that you mentioned migration, I just remember a a news piece that I read a few days ago talking about the admission of only two Ukrainians formally into the U.S. as migrants and all the propaganda that they has been saying about welcoming, you know, Ukrainian migrants, but in reality only two Ukrainian migrants were accepted like a few days ago. I, I read that piece of news like like four or five days ago and I was like what so anyway I'm gonna jump to the third question uh, to keep us on track and the third question is uh, do you think that replication of an scenario of Cold War or you know the missile crisis might be replicated in Latin America within the framework of the Ukrainian conflict Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> How is the situation over the world? What are looking the great powerful countries of the world? Latin America is plain of resources, but each time 
when there is an election or there is a new movement or a new politician or a new political party, it scares the United States because they think that the time when the, 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 the stabiat was the most important thing is getting away. And I maintain something that Clausewitz said, and it is a part of the intervention. The strategist Clausewitz said that the war constituted the exercise of politics by other means. What is intervention? Intervention is one of the manifestations of the world. I will read because I do forget. Since the occasion to the interest of the German countries at a specific moment and is implemented through wars of conquest, assaults and invasions, the modification of borders, and militarization, and actions against the law or protected by conceptions not agreed by international law, using extraordinary executions mass extermination, genocide, excessive weapons, paramilitarism, Colombia, for example, state, biological and media terrorism, among other methods, expressing the threat and use of force. The Treaty of Intervention exists in Latin America and Caribbean. We should not forget that from California to the Antarctica, the great powers want to return, to receive, to control our region. Someone that were, excuse me, there was a discussion about if United States was still interested in Latin America and in the Caribbean. Because they were in Iraq, they were in Afghanistan, a little war far, far from here. No, no, no. The fact is that they consider that Latin America and the Caribbean should be in their hands. Okay. And each step that takes a government from leftist, revolutionary, etc., they look for it and say, what is going to happen? It should not happen again. And that's why we think that it exists this possibility. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and also, I would say that in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, and, and when all the hum all humanity is watching the cracks in the capitalist system, uh, they need to, you know, distract the attention of humanity with a new war. And why don't, I mean, it's absolutely reasonable that they can, you know, try to spread the Ukrainian conflicts, you know, throughout Europe, but also they can try to in order to achieve their strategic uh, objectives, I'm talking about the U.S. and Europe, of course, NATO, uh, they could start, you know, trying to begin something in Latin America or in Taiwan, in China. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so that's a, a, an absolutely uh, possible and real scenario, in my opinion. So, so I agree with you uh, on that. Um, I'm going to jump to the last question, and. Uh, it is, it is as this, I mean, how are the strategies of imperial countries linked to try to reverse the consolidation of the new international order 
uh, that is glimpsed according to the opinion of the majority of international analysts. I think that the strategic pursuit by those countries are interlinked increasingly. And they, it is expressed by the uh, agreements among the most powerful. If you see the framework of the transatlantic alliance between the United States and the European Union, the group of seven, the Davos Forum, how the discussions in the Council and the, in the Commission of the European Union, how are the summits of NATO, how are some agreements in the organization of American states, where it is very difficult because there are countries and countries, and governments and governments, and some of them follow exactly what the United States say. If you see what is moved in the International Monetary Fund or in the World Bank, among others, we could say that there are agreements intrusive, adopted, that promote a situation. There is also a conference, the so-called uh, Munich conference, where sometimes they invite Russia or China, or they do not invite anyone, it depends on the time, where you see some lines that they are going to follow in the future or in the next future. Of course, it is an arrangement among the most powerful countries. And that's what the international analysts see, coming from one profession or from another, the journalists, the economists, the scientists, the strategists of different relations. They all agree that the world is in constant development. But I dare to repeat, but I state in my books, Metamorphosis of Intervention and Security and Terrorism, in the sense that intervening is meddling, interfering in the lives and decisions of others without taking into account the majority. That is what happens. And that is what I think that it is foreseen by the analysts over the world. If we fail, if we are right, it will belong to the history. Only that. That's true. That's true. And also, I mean, I mean, what you say is absolutely tr true, but at the same time, in my opinion, I believe that, you know, the steps taken by NATO, the European Union, Washington, in the particular context of the Ukrainian crisis, uh, somehow are pushing the appearance of a new world order in a more faster way. You know what I mean? I mean, yes. this, all the sanctions to Russia, for example, uh, the financial sanctions against Russia are pushing Russia and China to accelerate the, the way uh, they do business without using dollars. Because, I mean, and I believe that that's a signal for all the countries around the world that now are watching, are seeing more clearly how the U.S. and the European countries, especially the, the ones from the European Union, use uh, the dollar to twist the arm of other countries in order to reach their interventionist, you know, objectives. So, so, mm -hmm. so how is... Uh, is I believe that their, their intention is to revert the appearance of uh, the new world order, but with their aggression, they are pushing it. 
Don't you see it that way? I see it that way. I see that it is a fight, it is a struggle between old and new order. Mm. How and when it happens, we don't know. But it comes, it comes. Anyway, it will come. That's true. That's true. I wanted also to mention, uh, I, I just wanted to add something that I that has been in my head for several months and is related to the multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, uh, it's something that I read a few months ago that I had the, the opportunity to translate and a great work done by the Instituto Simón Bolívar here in Caracas. And they did this amazing work about the multi-stakeholder uh, scheme or approach that is used within the multilateral organizations to to subtract the relevance of the state as we know it and introduce the concept. I'm not introduce a concept, but introduce within the decision-making process in multilateral levels of corporations. And that's something that, uh, you know, opened my eye. When I translate that document, I uh, uh, it opened my mind because, for example, I realized how COVAX, the United Nations vaccination mm -hmm. program, is completely or mostly in the hands of corporations, uh, U.S. corporations, basically, that has been working in Africa for several years, maybe a couple of decades or more. And, 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 and with things like that, I, I just uh, like amazed by the, by the opportunity that Western countries are giving to corporations to get into the multilateral order and take decisions in uh, um, almost at the same level as the state, the sovereign states that were like the protagonists, the main actors in the international order as we knew it uh, a couple of decades ago. So I just wanted to mention that because I believe that somehow, you know, all these things are connected between because uh, they are tools designed by the powerful mm -hmm. to intervene in other countries. Disregarding if we are in the middle of, of a conflict like the one in Ukraine or in the middle of, uh, you know, particular, uh, you know, interventionist attempts like the ones in Cuba or the ones in Venezuela. So at the end of the day, in my opinion, uh, what is going to happen if this trend keeps moving on is that uh, the corporations are the ones that eventually are going to end up running the interests, uh, uh, I mean, running the decisions in the multilateral uh, organizations. And that's very scary because the only interest of corporation is making money. So anyway, I just want to comment on that because... That's something that amazed me. And I know that you are an expert in multilateral organizations or in diplomacy. I see something. And maybe it's the last thing we could exchange points of view today. ODS, the Sustainable Development Goals. Yes, Objectives. program until 2030 is basing most of the resources, the financial resources, on corporations. Change climate is also depending, in a way, from corporations. Yes, it's because crazy. If you have the possibilities, the financial possibilities. How ask Rwanda, Gambia, those countries, for instance, 
the governments are not able to pay anything in order to protect the climate. Then comes a corporation from the United England. Kingdom, United States, France, Latin, and so on, and starts a program in order to promote alternative measures or to the qualification of a worker, of a farmer, and so on. War yes. that started many, many years ago in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, mercenaries just private belong, belong directly or indirectly to corporations of different countries. Yes. Yes. What it's else? Complicated. It's complicated. Yes. Because yes. the states and the most powerful states depend in on corporations. Industry. Exactly. And who pay the campaigns of different governments? Corporations. Absolutely. Then we should not forget that maybe in multilateral spectrum, corporations will take a, a, a bigger role. Exactly. Exactly. That's a threat. That's, that's a, a, a enormous threat for you know the stability of the world. But anyway, I, I, I believe that that will, uh, uh, if we open that discussion, we will need like three more shows like this one. <laughs> I see so. <laughs> but we need to we need to talk about those things at least to you drop it there in order for people to see how complicated the international order is and how, and how we all have to be aware of those issues in order to do something to prevent them, to prevent intervention to happen, to prevent the control of the war by corporations, uh, and to allow countries to be more independent and sovereign as Cuba is doing, has been doing for decades, as we also in Venezuela has been trying to do in recent years. And of course that comes with a price, but I'm sure that you in Cuba and me in Venezuela and many others uh, within our countries are, you know, um, committed to keep fighting for that, for a better world that really cares about our people. So I, I, I we are done for today. I'm very happy and honored that you accept uh, our invitation. And uh, I just want to give you the mic if you want to say a few words because before we we close the interview thank you again leila thank you rodriguez until next time i will send you the text i will send you the text the written text this afternoon please